the post lunch session. So it's a great pleasure and a privilege to uh, welcome and uh, our very uh, you know, important and distinguished visitor, Dr. K. K. Ramakrishnan. Dr. K. K. Ramakrishnan, uh, in the world of networking and communications, need no introduction. For those of the students who probably land up in this area, even while they do their course, which is next semester, you realize there are a lot of protocols on the internet. Uh, thanks to the contribution of the guru of internet rights in front of us, Dr. K. K. Ramakrishnan. He is one person who in this, uh, in the area, has done so much of work that it's so hard to, you know, really uh, read out uh, the list of the accomplishments. Very few people in this world, I, I can probably say this with great confidence, have 150 publications, 90 US patents. I think only 90 US patents have probably one in a million people in this world. A uh, very brief introduction about Dr. KK, as you probably would have also read in the email and noticed that he is a distinguished member of technical staff in at and Research in New Jersey. Uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan is a fellow of uh, at and Research, he is a fellow of IEEE, and the list goes on and on. The honors go on and on. Some of the major protocols on the internet, such as a tech bit congestion avoidance protocol, and we'll do that next semester, so just keep your fingers crossed have been designed and proposed uh, by Dr. K. K. Ramakrishnan. Uh, he's been in at lab since 1994, and prior to that, he's been in Digital Equipment Corporation, which is another giant in the, in the area, uh, the former tech, that we know it. So it gives me a great, it's a great pleasure that Dr. Ramakrishnan, uh, in spite of his very busy schedule, you know, the SIPCOM conference starts in just a few days from now, the, Meridian, the biggest event in India and the area, he's here for that. And while they were going to Jaipur, I said, look, you have to stop here at the university and just share your vision and views with our students and with all of us faculty members, and he kindly agree. So be before I, I'm not going to stand between him and you, uh, but before I uh, hand over Dr. Ramakrishnan, uh, I'd like to just share with you that uh, we are very really delighted that he is now an adjunct faculty at NIT University. So this is the kind of people that we would like to have the time, more and more such people who are visiting slash adjunct faculty and he also very kindly agreed to teach the Communication Network School starting January. And I don't think in this country any institution can have a person as distinguished as Dr. KK teaching a course in networking. It's an absolute delight. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to stop here. I don't want to give a lecture. It's your lecture. And over to Dr. KK. Well, realize how boring I am. I'm going to try to do that here too, but um, to help me a little bit, I've got a video that has nothing to do with uh, at and or me, but it's something that I wanted to show you, to give you a perspective of where we've come uh, over the last maybe 20, 30 years. I, when I started uh, my grad school in 78, when I went to the US, there was very few people working in networking and it was an area that was still budding at and it was a narrow group of maybe 20, 30 people who were working that most of us didn't know. And if you look now, the amount of impact that it had with uh, the work in uh, communications and networking, I feel it's gone well beyond just that technology and the impact of individual components of that technology, but really it's impacted everything that you see in life. You know, if I, if I look at how we live, you know, um, the other day I went to a, a, a workshop where somebody was showing me a photograph of four people sitting next to each other, like these four are, but they're not looking at each other, they're not talking to each other. They're looking at their mobile devices and possibly communicating with each other through those devices rather than communicating face to face. You know, everybody is now tied to communications and networking as their means of socializing, Gaining information and almost interacting with the rest of the world. Um, if you look at how we are entertained, I know a lot of us still watch TV and that 
television programming is under the control of some set of people who we have no idea who they are and sometimes we question their intelligence. But as we go forward, what we see is that content is something that we will consume on demand, just like you consume on demand over the internet. But in a sense, all information that we get will end up being something that we will absorb as we want, when we want it, where we want it, what we want. And if you look at how we've gone in terms of conducting commerce, uh, even when I went uh, as a student, there was no such thing as an ATM. And uh, money was exchanged. There, there were very few people who had credit cards. And if I look now, those are things that you make assumptions that they're fact of life. And if you look on the back end of any one of those things, they're enabled primarily by the capability to communicate. And if you look at the change, and my perception is even what is being enabled here. Um, and, and I look at when I went from here and how we were as a society and how far we've come as a society in many respects, especially in technology. Globalization is something that has had a deep impact, I feel, in every aspect of our lives. In, in a sense, for developing societies, they're more rapidly developed. And if you look at developed societies, they've actually started seeing the rightful leveling of their uh, ability to produce as well as um, consume. If you, if you look at the expectation that people have had in developed societies in the past, it has been that they end up having some sense of a right to uh, have resources, whether it is theirs or produced somewhere else. And you, if you look at what has happened over the years, jobs have moved and standard of living in developed societies have started correcting to the point where there's no real saying that one society deserves more than another. And that leveling on, I feel, has happened to a large extent because of the ability to communicate and bring the world closer together. And if I look back, all of this has happened maybe in the last 20, 25 years. And for me, I feel like I've been fortunate in that it's this period where I've been involved in, and it's the period where if I, if I look at our <coughs> chain in the world, I feel that we are in the middle of a information and communications revolution, or technology, just like maybe what has happened in the last couple of centuries with industrial revolution. And this has happened in such a short time. And to be able to experience that in one's adulthood lifetime is, is wonderful. And um, I've been working at ATT Labs for, for a while now. And I feel like we've been involved in the midst of this communications revolution for a long time. But the rapidity with which things have changed over the short period of the last 10, 20 years compared to, you know, our folks developed the telephone, they developed the transistor, they invented these things. And if you look at the rapidity of change over the last 10, 20 years, it's dramatic. And it's no longer a small group of people making changes. Everyone is able to make changes. Students like you folks have created things like BitTorrent, Google, all of those things. And students maybe not even like you folks. People who didn't go to uh, college made change. But a lot of it is because of the ability of technology to empower people to create. And um, the area that I've been working on is looking at how networking can help in convergence of all sorts of information. And so I thought I'll show you a little video that was produced by somebody and you see a bunch of these kinds of 
did you know videos on YouTube? And I find it very interesting. I hope you have not seen it. I would be, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if almost all of you have seen it, but I found it interesting. And so I want to show that to you folks. If only my PC would uh, swap. It's been running for a long time, and one thing with Microsoft Windows is that it doesn't uh, like running for a long time. You need to boot it up uh, every so often. Unfortunately, I've not done that, so please bear with me.
the reason I put this up was because it covers a lot of the areas that we in ATP research have been working on. If you look at what we've seen over these years, if, if you look at all the aspects that these folks talked about, um, convergence, um, if you look at how with the same information being made available, changing to people. Um, I see in the U.S. that there's been a gut-wrenching change in the way people who are doing traditional businesses, like newspapers, like television, are you know, having <coughs> tremendous difficulties. If you look at the music business, for instance, they have no longer an assurance that somebody who produces good music deserves to get a reward for it other than the satisfaction of having produced music. So all of these I see as issues that will have to be sorted out as we go forward in the way that people view information, value information, and how we then deal with scale, how we deal with performance, how we deal with security, and um, that's the space that we in at and are in. Um, we've been working in um, communications research for a long time, really long time, and we've produced really good ideas, starting from the telephone, when Alexander Graham Bell uh, invented it, and that's what started our uh, whole um, at and legacy. Uh, we've worked on telephony. We invented the transistor. We've invented the laser, and, and so on and so forth. And in terms of uh, you know operating systems, Unix, the language that hopefully a lot of you will learn, C language, and and so on and so forth. But you know that if you look over the time frame, you know. That's been almost, you know, from the 1800s or maybe 1900, let's say, a, a century. And if you look at what's happened over the last 10 years, I feel we've invented so many things as as a world in communications that one can count almost as many fundamental things as it looks like that we've invented over the last hundred years. And, and that's what I see in what we're doing. We're rapidly moving forward. And what at t has been working on, you know, we work on running a very large network, worldwide network. Um, we run a whole bunch of services. Um, we make sure that that network is protected. Our users and our businesses are protected and scale well get the performance that they need. And a big part of our business is in convergence in the sense of being able to have a data network that is used for all sorts of information usage and communication. So if you look at our voice network, what we started off with telephony, which was all analog, now most of our uh, voice communications is over voice over IP. If you look at how we're also a, a provider of uh, entertainment TV, just like cable TV is. We provide it over an IP network. We uh, have a very large business of uh, being a cellular provider. And a significant part of that is IP. And what I want to say from that is that all of this is moving over to being on top of one single platform, which is the uh, IP packet data network, which is what is the basis for the internet. And uh, there's a range of things that we do in research in uh, at and and a big part of that is running our network and managing our network, uh, doing a tremendous amount of work on traffic analysis and managing services, and a large part of that has to do with making sure that we run a secure network, 
that we anticipate and manage things like when you have viruses that spread. What we've seen in the past is that viruses have spread to disable networks and PCs among uh, users in the past. And that it used to be a regular news cycle of how you had a new virus come out that was shutting down networks and PCs and so on. And if you look over time, the technologies that we have created for intrusion detection, for identifying malware dis uh, distribution and so on, you see now that there's less and less of that uh, spread of things like worms and viruses in our networks. And, and a lot of that is due to the work that we've done in ATT. If you look at what's happened over the years, you know, when I started in 1994 at ATT, the technology that we had for our long distance network was basically T1 lines, which is like 1.5 megabits. Maybe a few, what we call T3, which are 45 megabits. And if you look at what we have now, in our backbone networks, it's 40 gigabits. And that is not enough. And we're constantly having to create new technology. And some of our researchers have been involved in creating 100 gigabit networks, long distance, which is breakthrough technology compared to what used to be thought as being possible only in the last three, four years ago, that 40 gig was hard. And now, 100 gig is around the corner. And uh, another big part of what we're doing is looking at how to exploit uh, clouds of computing and storage resources. And I'll speak a little bit about that, because that's an area that I spend a fair amount of time in. Um, another area that at and has been working on, um, and something that I expect has impacted many of your lives is in speech recognition and uh, for some people also text-to-speech uh, and having natural voice for text-to-speech rather than having a robot speak. But if you look at how we've gone over the last 10 years to having interactive voice recognition so that you don't have necessarily have an operator for every function when you call on the telephone and that's true of many of the things that I see now in India as well. In the US that's become actually a matter of course and unfortunately it's gotten a little out of hand in that you hardly have any human beings to talk to when you have to solve a problem and then as a result we need to not only have the capability to process voice but also have artificial intelligence to be able to understand practical issues that people have just like a human would. And uh, there's a lot of machine learning work that we do in our lab uh, for being able to help in that process. Uh, another space that I work on a lot is in looking at how to deal with scale for uh, video distribution and it comes in the context of our IPTV environment that we have that's nationwide, uh, just like a nationwide cable network. And what we are doing is seeing that very rapidly we're seeing people consume video more on demand than uh, watching television. If you look at television programs in the US, if you have a new series show show up, uh, on a Monday. On Wednesday, you can watch it on demand. And you watch it on demand with very little ads at the time you want, on a device that you want. And as a result, there's a fairly rapid growth of on-demand viewing in our IPTV environment. And that imposes tremendous scale and performance challenges. And that's another area that we've been working on quite a lot. Um, so if you look at the space that we work on and what we anticipate being working on for the next several years, one is large scale. If you look at uh, our 
expectation of how the network will grow, you know, we see it going uh, by leaps and bounds, you know, doubling in speed maybe in three, four years, and doubling in scale just like uh, Moore's law maybe in one, two, three years of that, that order. Security is a, another area that we work on because all of us have now come to depend on the network for many of our daily functions. And for, in fact, for you folks over here, I feel being remote. The fact that you can be remote, I believe, is something where you can learn to exploit communications for being able to have as rich a life here as anywhere else by exploiting network communications. And which means that you need to not only have um, scale and performance, but you need to also make sure that that communications that you are depending on is secure. And it's an area that we spend a tremendous amount of energy on. And mobility is something that I'm sure I, I doubt if anybody here doesn't have a cell phone. And I've seen that not having a cell phone when I land in Delhi poses tremendous challenges. And we've grown to have communications capability um, as we are mobile. If you look at what it used to be in the 70s when I was in India, it was hard to get to a phone. And if you did get to a phone, it was hard to get to somebody you wanted to reach at the other end because you didn't have somebody who had a phone at the other end. Maybe, uh, you know, that, that's being a little uh, extreme than what it really was. But if you look now, the communications capability that people have here is on par with anywhere else. And I believe that that's because of technology enabling people and cheaply. And so the, the one space that I'm going to cover for five minutes, I, I have a whole bunch of slides that, which I don't think I'll cover, but I wanted to give you a sense of the convergence of computing and communications, uh, which is an area that uh, is close to my heart at the moment, and an area that I've been spending a fair amount of time. And that would uh, be a representative example of all the pieces that I think about, which is that we need to worry about performance, we need to worry about scale, we need to worry about security. And it's how we can exploit cloud platforms which have computing and storage capability that are not necessarily local, but still be able to have people use those resources wherever they are. And the area that I spend a lot of time is in seeing how we can do that for enterprises. If you look at what's happened over the last four or five years, I don't know if anybody has not heard of Amazon. I suspect every one of you has. Um, and they have been uh, the ones who have come out the earliest with being able to do cloud computing. And the reason is they have a tremendous amount of computing resources in their data centers that they uh, put together for processing all of the things that you folks buy from Amazon, which is books. Started with books, but now it's, it's almost anything that you can buy. And those resources now can be used to not only provide the same capabilities that their business needed, but they realize that those resources can now be used by anyone else on demand. And that helps tremendously in being able to reduce the cost of using those resources. Imagine if we didn't have to build out all the infrastructure for this Commonwealth Games, and instead were able to use resources that were uh, put together, let's say, for the last Olympics and run the Commonwealth Games virtually. It's a ridiculous idea in the physical world, but in the virtual world, it makes sense, which is what we're doing, which is that if you have computing 
resources up in the cloud. That what I mean by up in the cloud is in the network, in a data center far away. And if you had communication capability that makes the ability to use those computing resources far away as if they were close to you, that is high speed, very low delay, then you can have your needs met on demand. So you don't have to buy a computer that has the capability to show this video uh, like I did here and not have enough resources to show it. And instead, you can have computing capability on demand to the extent that you need it, you need it only when you need it. And that's what cloud platforms have provided. And in the process, they have brought down the cost of computing and they've brought down the cost of storage for people. And they don't have to invest in infrastructure. And enterprises now, almost if you think about an IT department for a large company, it's probably bad news for these guys, they have to justify why they need to get computing locally. Why they could use, let's say, Amazon's EC2 cloud platform for being able to use the computing resources that are remote and just pay for it only when it is needed as much as they use. And so IT departments end up now seeing that they now have to justify resources being invested locally versus using it remotely. Microphone went off, right? You guys can hear, okay. So the area that I work on is how enterprises can use these cloud platforms in a way that integrates not only computing and storage but also networking capabilities so that it is secure because if you think about an enterprise let's say NAIT wants to have all of their payroll processing out of the cloud and it's over an internet wide open network and if it was not secure the folks in your accounting department or your payroll department are not going to think or allow for their payroll processing to be put out in the cloud. So you need the capability for the communication between the cloud platform where you have computing and storage resources and the PC that is out in the office far away in some other town be able to communicate securely. And that's what we're doing with the work that we do which is to have a notion of a cloud but that is private but virtually private in the sense that a cloud site can be used by an enterprise to be able to have secure collection of uh, processing resources and storage and one which allows us to now be able to seamlessly connect a whole bunch of these enterprise sites with the cloud resources and we've been looking at how to make networking enable this and uh, it's an area that's growing tremendously it's an area that's also uh, resulting in a tremendous amount of savings of uh, uh, expense if you think about how um, large financial firms in New York work they now see that if you want to have computing capabilities, you might have some locally, but you want to be able to absorb spikes and you can't invest for those spikes. So instead, you use cloud resources on demand. The other thing that we plan for is for disaster recovery. So when you have large scale failures, like when we had 9-11 for instance, um, you want to make sure that all of your uh, data is secure and that you can start running your business off of a remote site quickly. And that's what um, cloud resources are able to do very, very quickly as well. So we are in this space of pulling together um, networking that has much higher speed, much higher capacity um, in providing capabilities that used to be traditionally viewed as inside one's own machine room. Now, the world has become the machine room. Um, 
There are many, many more uh, slides that I could keep covering, but uh, I know Rajiv said that a whole bunch of students have a class at 2.45, and that I should shut up at uh, that time precisely, and I believe it is 2.45. I've been looking at his watch quite a lot. So <laughs> thank you very much. And, uh, take any one or two questions, maybe, if you have, and then let you go. So one thing that I noticed in the US versus being in India is that students in the US ask questions and they're not afraid because in the US there are no such things as a question that's stupid because when you ask a question that doesn't reflect understanding it's usually because of the communicator's fault. So feel free to ask questions because that's how you learn too. Yes. So what is cloud computing? What is cloud computing then? So what does it mean? To me, cloud computing is a bunch of computers, if you will, that are in a data center far away, anywhere, or in many, many data centers far away, that you can use as if they were in your data center locally, in your machine room here somewhere. The thing is, when we think about cloud as being a network, okay, and cloud computing, meaning that the computing resources are in the network somewhere, and you don't care where it is. If you look at how we want to be able to provide cloud computing for global enterprises, we would like people in India, for instance, or in Australia to be able to use resources that are close by to them and then be able to use the same resources when folks in the US wake up and continue their design. For instance, when I used to talk with uh, Rajiv when he was at GM, they have design centers in China, India, South Africa, US, right? maybe there are many more but at least these four places they have and you would like the data, the design work that they're doing to follow the sun if you will. Right? And so you don't want to have something done here and then copy that all over to South Africa because the amount of time it takes to copy it all over will probably be more than the time it takes for you to, uh, for, for the sun to move over. And so you won't be able to have all of those resources out in the network somewhere. And that's really what it is. So what is the Sit up. So what is the difference between grid computing and cloud computing? I'm glad you're asking because I don't see any. And you know, it's essentially the same concept in the, in the sense we started off with what we call grid computing which is to be able to have computing up, out in the network somewhere. And if you listen to my answer to his previous question, it's exactly the same. Right? The, 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 the overall idea has evolved a little bit, uh, but in a sense it's the same uh, philosophy. And that's what I'm, I want to make sure that what I do makes you feel comfortable that it is just as secure. And the thing that we've been doing with networking, for, especially for enterprises, is what we call private networks. Um, I have a cousin who is in Delhi who works for BSNL and his primary business for the government is to provide these lines. What that means is T1 and T3 links, okay? And the reason that the government uses them is because of security. That they've got a dedicated line for communication between two points, okay? Let's say two uh, sites for the government. What we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is to be able to use a packet network and not have a dedicated lead line between those two points 
and still be able to provide the same level of security. And what we do is rather than having to place the responsibility of that security on those two endpoints and the enterprise, like the government having to deal with it, we take it over and have the right set of firewalls and, and the functions that are needed to make sure that even if you have a multiplex packet network that you're sending data through, it still is as secure. Okay? Thank you very much.